Today's episode of the Stallside Podcast was brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. Have you ever wondered what HISA is, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority? This week, I talked to Dr. Stuart Brown from Keeneland, Vice President of Equine Safety. He explains what HISA is and what the consequences are of not taking a nationally coordinated approach to equine safety and welfare and its effect on the public trust. Dr. Brown, welcome to Stallside. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. Stuart, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, thank you. I, yeah, it, it really is an honor to be here with you today. I, um, you know, for myself and for my background, um, I was foaled and raised in Woodford County, so uh, I'm from Versailles, Kentucky, so I didn't get very far in life. Um, but I, uh, I literally have grown up as a product of the Central Kentucky horse population. Um, I grew up here working in the industry from the time I was about 13 years old, and Started out, you know, kind of working where we are situated in the factory floor of the industry, you know, on broodmare farms, working with yearlings and foaling mares, working with stallions. And along the way, you know, met some professional mentors in veterinary medicine, namely Dave Parrish and Dave Fishback, who had always been kind enough to put, take me under their wing on days off, you know, and introduced me to a lot about veterinary medicine. That's the only thing I really ever knew I wanted to be. And I've been fortunate enough, I wound up going to undergrad here at Transylvania University and Lexington, and then going to Tuskegee University's uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, graduating from there in 1991, and then came back to an internship at Haggard's, um, wound up, you know, finishing my internship there, was an associate for several years, became a partner, and then wound up on their executive committee, was president of Haggard's for a number of years, had a 30-year career there as a practitioner, and then in July of 2020, um, I was you know, at least uh, approached by Bill Thomason at Keeneland about an opportunity, a vision that he had for a veterinarian to actually work for Keeneland and work there on behalf of advocacy for the horse and equine safety. And so it was a role that Bill Thomason himself kind of defined that he thought might be a really important advocacy moment because Keeneland as an association is really foundationally built on a mission for the benefit of the horse. Uh, it was built by horsemen for horses. And so his vision was to integrate that uh, approach from a veterinary perspective in terms of how they can do more and more things for and on behalf of the racing athlete, as well as the sales participants, you know, that we would have in our sales. And so it was kind of an interesting conversation that he and I initiated on. Um, throughout my career, I have served in a lot of organized veterinary leadership positions. And in the course of doing some of those, being the chairman of the Gluck Center, also uh, very proud of the work I've done as the Kentucky Veterinary Medical Association as an officer there. Uh, I've gotten to work with a lot of my colleagues, not just at Haggard's, but those at Root and Riddle and across other parts or disciplines of veterinary medicine. Uh, currently, I'm the delegate, AAP's delegate to the House of Delegates of the AVMA. I've been involved with the AVMA Trust as a trustee representing Equine for about 15 years. So uh, currently, I'm vice chair of that organization as well. And so kind of have had an opportunity to kind of give back in a lot of real relevant ways. And I shared a lot of those experiences, too, with Bill Thomas. And when I'd crossed paths with him, we had worked together for about 25 years when he was at Mill Ridge before he went to Keeneland. And so we'd had the opportunity working for Alice Chandler together on a lot of things that were important for especially the thoroughbred industry. And so we had a lot of synergies. We did a lot of, had a lot of conversations leading up to 2020 about the challenges that the industry was facing, in particular, what had happened at Santa Anita in 2019, uh, the role of veterinary medicine in terms of protecting and advocating for the horse, things that Keeneland could also do to support um, the evolution of that in our industries, both, I think, at the racing and the sales level. And so it was kind of became a little bit of a natural conversation that, that he and I were sharing in on a lot of challenges the industry was facing at the time. And it led to uh, this position that he defined that I took on as the equine safety director at Keeneland. Uh, he was shortly after that, he retired from Keeneland and Shannon Arvin became the president who was just an incredible person. I'd worked with Shannon a lot leading up to that. Her father, Buddy Bishop, would have been outside of veterinary medicine, one of my mentors as an mm -hmm. attorney here in Lexington for a number of years and worked with a lot of my clients uh, when I was in equine practice. And so 
a lot of great synergies with her. She's just a phenomenal leader. We have an, you know, just an incredible team of people joining us there, you know, Gatewood Bell and Tony Lacey there. And so everybody's alignment is really very impressive at Keeneland in terms of what we try to do for the horse. And for me, you know, the responsibility that I have on behalf of all the horses, you know, the charge I accepted is that everywhere Keeneland touches a horse, they expect to find me there. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge thing, you know, when we get into our race meets and there are 12 or 1,400 horses on the ground. Uh, I'm assisted by George Mundy there, who had 30 years of regulatory experience. He works uh, alongside me as a racing safety officer. And so we have a great tandem there. Um, One of the things that evolved while Shannon got there was also Keeneland defined safety as an entire division now at Keeneland. And so uh, as I'm now a vice president there at Keeneland over safety, it also incorporates security. And so I work with the security department there, Philip Gardner, who's our director of security, and his team because the integrity issues that we certainly recognize as a part of our sport and protecting and advocating for those equine racing athletes also have a lot to do with the security of the grounds. And so uh, it becomes a bit of an all encompassing, you know, approach to how we advocate for the horse doing all of those things to work on behalf of Keeneland to make sure we safeguard uh, all the things that where the horse can be touched on our grounds. Uh, uh, you've done a lot for the profession, Stuart. I mean, and it- You've really just touched on a little bit of it. And I think from all of us that know you and for the people out there that don't know you, I'd thank you on their behalf for all the things that you've done, the advocacy for the horse and your push into the safety and welfare of the horse now. And personally, I'd like to thank you for, even though I worked in a different practice, you always met me with a smile on your face and a handshake. And I just look on you as one of the people that made uh, coming to this town from the outside a really good experience. Well, it's kind of you to say, I, you know, I have a, you know, I think the admiration I've always had for colleagues, you know, to share what we have in the veterinary profession. Um, you know, we always learn from it, from mm-hmm. one another. I think, um, and, and you know, I say this a lot when we're at Keeneland. You know, um, when people ask me, you know, about alignment and things like that, we do. I, mean, I always tell people we're here working for the horse. Yep. And I think what we find for people that you know, in a in especially in a community like Lexington, and you're working in this town, you know, while there may be differences in terms of where we are employed, there's so many similarities about the number of things we all kind of do in terms of working on a day to day basis uh, on behalf of our clients and on behalf of the horse itself yeah and so uh, I think that's a great um, unifying you know piece in terms of what we all do here together yeah I look at it on as that you know uh, we all wear a different shirt but we're on the same team and that's the team of the horse and you you talked about uh, respect and part of that respect is safety and welfare of the horse and we're here today to talk about HISA right and that's something that a lot of people have heard of I don't think a lot of people probably really truly understand what the aim is could you expand upon that for us please yeah I think um, you know it's kind of very timely too because um, as the historical uh, historically you know the the industry's had a tough time kind of facing some of the challenges that we certainly had on a racing landscape, you know, in terms of things like the 38 racing jurisdiction patchwork that you hear people talk about a lot with different modifications of drug testing or as terms of medication rules and policies that are kind of there that are somewhat um, restrictive in terms of the state led you know regulatory fabric that you that people you know face and so been challenging for horsemen it's certainly challenging for veterinarians trying to care for those horses while we've had a number of unifying you know groups over the years like the arci and others that have and, you know have kind of worked through a lot of the challenges that we have there it's very been very difficult to sort of have the industry come together and to be taken seriously as a national sport i mean i think when you think of the parallels that exist in the national basketball association or the national football league or major league baseball you know we certainly find a common fr- framework there around leadership you know that's driven from a uh, top down type approach that sort of pulls everything together in terms of those franchise offices all together, you know, under one umbrella. And we've struggled, you know, at times from the standpoint of a state's right versus a unifying national approach for horse racing. And so I think what the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act, or HISA, you know, represents is the industry's best effort to try to pull all of us together under a one set of uniform guidelines. And so it helps in terms of the advocacy and safety of the horse for us to adopt some uh, benchmarking, you know, approaches and procedures for how we look at horses from a safety perspective. So there's two arms of HISA. There's this one 
piece of it that is safety. It's a safety committee. And then there's also the anti-doping and medication program as well, which the ADMC, as it's called, is about to really em be embarked upon on March the 27th. Um, it's been a two-phase approach. You know, HISA sort of was formed from a, a federal mandate in 2020 about law signed by President Trump at the time. The formation of HISA was directed through a board called the Authority. That board or that authority had been appointed from a nominating committee, and it's got nine members on it. And below that group are the safety program and the anti-doping and medication program that exist. And so I think that's a really important thing to sort of tease out a little bit, too. I think the initial approach to this was, what do we do about uniform medication? What do we do about laboratory accreditation standards, you know, that reinforce that medication approach that we have for, you know, protecting the horses, you know, and putting everybody on a level playing field. But then we also, you know, recognize that there's so many other facets related to the safety of the horse, whether they be, you know, track surface testing, you know, how we advocate in terms of our approaches to sort of evaluate horses when we look at risk factors. I mean, one of the things you point out a little bit in terms of service to the horse that's kind of happened over the years has been, you know, the investment that in particular our profession, veterinarians have made a huge investment in things like the equine injury database, something that's been supported by the Grace and Jockey Club. Um, we've seen these wellness safety uh, seminars that have been put on, you know, and Keeneland hosts those over a number of years and about the information that's been shared there, best practices that have been developed, the approach that's been adopted in a lot of ways have all been things that have evolved that have led us to this point where there's been this opportunity to execute on this approach that HISA has taken to bring uniformity to an industry on behalf of advocating for the racing athlete. And so while that all those things, there's been a lot of build up to that over the last year and a half to get to an execution phase, the first start of it being the safety program that began last July. Uh, and now we'll recognize, you know, the uh, the benefit of all that work and the anti-doping and medication control program that will be there. Um, you know, we've certainly seen over the years lots of varying experiences that horsemen have had with reported positives or overages for therapeutic medications. Those are the kinds of things in terms of the due process, how those things are approached now from a testing perspective that we hope will be brought to a lot of greater clarity, a much more efficient process and how those things are handled. And then obviously this will be the kind of information that's shared against all the racing jurisdictions that participate in HISA so that horsemen and veterinarians that care for the horses that are in part of racing know exactly how to care for those horses and how to, uh, you know, if they're treating or advocating for their best interests, they know exactly how to approach those things in order to comply with a set of national regulatory guidelines. And I think the public needs to know this because, you know, human athletes get caught with drug residues. But if you're that human athlete, you probably know your trainer's doing something that they shouldn't. The horse only gets what it's given. Correct. And so it is up to us to make sure that there's never a situation where the public trust is breached. And if it is... It needs to be dealt with um, uniformly and openly. Yeah, I think you bring up two really good points, too, is the public's trust. You know, I think we want people to understand, um, you know, we, we have a great story to tell. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about the negative. You know, I know that from a media standpoint, what bleeds, you know, is, is it reads and that kind of thing. And so, you know, people kind of tend to focus on the negative. But we have a great positive story to tell when you look at, you know, the, the amount of drug testing that gets done in our sport in thoroughbred. Uh, racing in particular, we have an infinitesimal small number of positives, and of that number of positives, the vast majority of them are th therapeutic medication overages. Part of what that represents is that we're dealing with a biological entity. Horses, un not unlike people, mm -hmm. are not all the same. We use, you know, guidelines in terms of treatment and whatnot, but not all horses metabolize things the same way. And so there are standard deviations built into these, you know, calculations for the detection of, you know, uh, laboratory thresholds and that kind of thing. But not all horses process things the same. And so we wind up with some variation in results, and then it's left up to us to try to interpret them. Part of our responsibility, though, needs to be to not just the, the, the public or society at whole, but also a, a betting public as well to reinforce the integrity of the game part so that there's confidence in terms of participating in our sport. And I think 
that becomes a, another moniker of responsibility that we all share together to do that. Cast against that, though, is also the evolution of, of laboratory testing, you know, not unlike every other technology that we can think of that, whether it be electric cars or, or you know, our computer networks or anything like that, laboratory testing has become increasingly more sophisticated. It's more specific. It's more sensitive. Um, the environment that horses live in are, you know, not one that's, uh, you know, hermetically controlled, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they live in a barn backside environment, so they are, they integrate and, and race at varying locations, so they move around a little bit, they're transported, so they're exposed to lots of different things, and sometimes those exposures lead to potential positive residues that you refer to that we've seen in other sports. And then it becomes up to us to kind of interpret whether those things are real or they are environmental, you know, contamination, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so I think part of our responsibility here and what I think HISA represents is an, a unified approach for how we, how we advance in understanding the environment with which horses race in, uh, where they're trained, how they're cared for, uh, bringing together, you know, a set of guidelines and also a set of laboratory standards so that we can judge accurately exactly how those horses are being cared for and how they're being presented in competition. You very elegantly explained the benefits of having a uniform set of standards for everybody to adhere to. Where could the industry go if we do not have an attempt at uniformity? Yeah, you know, so a number of folks that, you know, I've kind of, um, you know, advocated, you know, on this my process before work to collaborate on how we as an industry would approach this i mean you and i share you know also collegially you know work that mm -hmm. uh our part of the demographic of the profession share in the aep the aep the american association of equine practitioners has been a tremendous leader in this space uh charter member of the racing medication and testing consortium over the years rmtc has probably been the, one of the industry's great unifying efforts to try to look at a lot of these things in terms of publishing standards, withdrawals, thresholds, guidelines, you know, relative to what we know about testing, drug testing in the horse. Um, but the AEPs had also this role of also being the expert in equine well-being as well as terms of, you know, its role as an advocate, you know, on behalf of the, especially the equine racing athlete. It, was, it has its roots in being founded by a group of racetrack practitioners at the Brown Hotel in Louisville mm -hmm. almost some 70-something some years ago. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing, you know, in terms of the responsibility of veterinary medicine has often had in this space over the years. And it's kind of interesting now to look at a lot of the things that have been initiated in HISA, uh, also the HIWU effort, which is the, the anti-doping and medication arm of the HISA effort, that you find it peppered with a lot of really uh, qualified and experienced veterinarians who have been involved and engaged in regulatory veterinary work over the years to hopefully help to promulgate these this approach. Approach. Because previous to this, there have been efforts like in the Mid-Atlantic, which you have to tip your hat to that group of nine states, and a number of others that have tried to form racing compacts to actually pull as many of them on a regional basis together who share uh, similar populations of horses that race across some, you know, eight or nine different racetracks. You know, we certainly talk about this. I mean, I'm really fortunate uh, in the role I have at Keeneland. Uh, I engage quite a bit with Dr. Will Farber, who's my counterpart at Churchill Downs, Dr. Michael Hardy, who's an Indiana Grand, um, you know, to kind of work, you know, and, and, uh, the three of us share a population of horses that we talk a lot about what we're trying to do to help horsemen and those horses that want to compete or race within our circuit. And so the compact idea of people approaching uh, that patchwork piece to pull together, you know, the environment of a number of different parts of the country to kind of lead to some level of uniformity is, is not a new concept. It was certainly something that under RMTC, where we had divided, you know, had defined these four pillars for which, you know, states could all kind of work to bring all of the system together, uh, was something that had been tried for, you know, a little over a decade and a half. However, we, we really ran into trouble over the years from a state standpoint excuse me, of trying to get all of those things adopted and pull all of them together in a national program. And so under, you know, the national, the, what they called NUMP at the time, which was a part of that effort, there was a pretty serious, you know, effort put forth to try to bring what was done in these different regional pockets all together in terms of a best standard. And that just didn't really had a difficult time ever getting to the place we got to until there was a federal mandate under HISA in order to sort of bring all of us together under one umbrella. 
if we lived in a world where there wasn't this effort, where would we go with racing? Yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, that's another really good segue. I think one of the things we need to also recognize is the landscape and the environment for which, you know, thoroughbred racing in particular, um, you know, operates right now. I mean, from the standpoint of the public image of the sport, uh, we we have to recognize there is a societal license for us to operate and for us to, you know, be out there in terms of having horses in competition. And I and I don't take that part lightly. I think that's a really important facet of this. Not 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 the lightly part about what we um, what the lenses were looked at through from the public, but the op- opportunity to share what we all recognize in terms of what horses do for people. Um, and I've said this on a couple of different platforms before that. You know, I think in a world that recognizes so many negative things, you know, and there's a a yearning a lot of times for something positive, horses give back to people in certain uh, ways now in terms of lifting spirits, you know, their elegant uh, movement, they almost have a spiritual nature to them and what they do in terms of their connectivity with people. And so, you know, part of what we're also doing in advocacy is demonstrating, you know, how much we do care for them and how all these things that we can do on their behalf. And I think that becomes, you know, a really important part of what is happening within this effort within HISA to ensure that that's there for generations to come. I think that's something that we owe the horse. You know, that's something that we also owe to generations to come so that they can continue to enjoy the horse. Um, One of the things that I've been relatively involved with, you know, in the last six months or so that I also think is a really important thing to cast against this as a parallel is certainly what we're seeing happen and emerging in an unregulated horse racing space. Um, Currently, you know, there's over almost 125 known unregulated horse racing tracks in states that don't have regulatory oversight in racing. And so these standards that we recognize that are there to protect the horse in terms of medication use, or, you know, the safety programs we have in place and all these things to do to advocate for the well-being of the horse don't take place in those in those locations. And so by their sheer absence, we have a lot of horses exposed to potential injury. We have horses that are exposed to varying, you know, landscapes and environments with when the, which when those horses are competing. And so it becomes a really stark contrast in why it's so important for us to get the you know, the uniform standard uh, approach that we have under HISA right to make sure that we advocate fully for the racing av- athlete in, in the North America and that we also make sure that we cast it against any of these other unregulated ones that we know definitely put the horse at risk. You know, as a public, as a society, as a caring group of people that, you know, have oversight over the well-being of the, of the horse, we, we can't hardly tolerate for that type of thing to exist in, in, Amer- in North America. That was actually quite surprising to me to, to hear that, that there are tracks out there racing horses and there is no oversight. Because, you know, a lot of people bring their horses in to see me and they'll tell me the horse is the best person they know. <laughs> and right. the horse has fed a lot of people and has put a roof over every single one of our heads. And so it's part of giving back is to do the best by them. And it's very surprising to me that, as you say, people would allow that to happen or tolerate a situation where we're not trying to uh, run these horses in the best possible environment when we can to protect them, to pay them back for all the things they do for us. Yeah, and I think, you know, probably some of that's cultural. I mean, I think, you know, for as long as people have owned horses, there's been the nature of the horse and rider combina- combination in terms of, you know, the enjoying the partnership and then the competition that sort of has existed between them. Um, many of these locations are also set up in, in areas where there are match racing going on, there's mixed breed racing going on, that kind of thing. But the lack of oversight there or the lack of the ability to bring a standard for care for them in order to uh, ensure that those horses are cared for appropriately, um, not, you know, both from a, the standpoint of the horse's own well-being, but also from an infectious disease standpoint, you know, making sure that we, you know, for all of us in regulatory, you know, uh, environments within racing, you know, they're the standards for, you know, the presentation of horses that have had, you know, health certificates done in the last 10 days, and they've been inspected by an accredited veterinarian and they have the appropriate testing that's required and vaccination programs that are required and all these things are done to help maintain the and care for the health and well-being of an entire population of horses 
to include the individuals that are there. And in these unregulated spaces, none of that is going on. So then we are putting potentially lots of other horses in peril by potentially co-mingling and mixing these groups of horses together that have no standard for testing going on and potentially are exposed to infectious diseases, which certainly plays into the world that we need the internal medicine colleagues, you know, in terms of our experts and in terms yeah. of helping to address the needs of those individual horses that become ill or debilitated. Yeah, and that's actually a potentially frightening scenario in that you have one population that is actually doing things right and you have another population where you don't know what's going on. Right. And when they co-mingle, as you, as you pointed out, we don't need another health outbreak that can be prevented. I mean, certain things are going to happen, but any herpes virus outbreak we can stop yeah. is a good one. Yeah. And I can sort of see from what you've described that this is a risk to the entire industry not just that unregulated portion, if standards are not applied. I think the striking thing, too, to me about that landscape as it's evolved in the last five years, there's almost been an explosion of this activity. And so while it's been in certain regional pockets of the United States, we now find it really spread all the way across the United States. I mean, right now, um, talking to some of my colleagues in USDA, I don't think there's a single state we don't know of that has an unregulated racetrack presence in them. And that's a little bit frightening in terms of the amount of effort that we see going on on the high landscape in order to unify 38 validated racing jurisdictions that are trying to certainly do this from a sanction standpoint and have a regulatory framework from which competition can exist. Again, this is actually quite eye-opening to hear all of this because... I'll tell you now, I didn't realize there was so much unregulated racing going on. So we, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the fact that, you know, AEP's public policy council that I sit on had discussed this issue in San Antonio in November at its annual convention. And so um, very shortly after that was the winter meeting of the House of Delegates for the AVMA. And our national, you know, veterinary association actually didn't even have a policy relative to this unregulated horse racing. And so in January... Um, presented on the House of Fl Floor, the House of Delegates there, and in reference committee was a resolution that was passed and adopted unanimously to condemn this practice of unregulated horse racing in North America. And I think that was really important for the National Veterinary Association to take a stance. It needs to be something that other industries refer to where the veterinarian is the expert in horse health to recognize, and it's teased out in that resolution, all the numerable things that are potential risks for the equine racing athlete and why uh, it would be justifiable to condemn those practices. And so uh, the AP Racing Committee now, you know, has reviewed that policy position, has adopted that, you know, as well as the AEP Board of Directors. And so, you know, I encourage people to kind of be aware of those issues because I think we'll hear more about them. I think it'll be very important for the health and welfare of the horse nationally for us to address uh, those needs. Uh, I think local uh, authorities have a difficult time dealing with this situation, so I'm very hopeful that this national resolution that was taking place on behalf of veterinary medicine is also something local and regional authorities can look to and say, yes, this shouldn't be taking place. It's unregulated. It is someplace that we need to be found taking care of those horses and then other nefarious activities that may be going on in those locations that are also a human health risk. Right. So, Heiser, because it is sort of like a federally driven mandate, by some people will be seen as overreach. Mm. What would be your elevator speech counter to that to sort of say, no, you need to get on board with this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, change is hard. I think change is hard for all of us. I mean, it's it's difficult, and it's certainly difficult in this environment because we have so many multiple players that are involved, uh, all of them centrally, you know, located around the horse at the eye of that storm, you know, in particular. But in varying ways, everybody has this touch point, you know, with the roles they have for the horse. And so to pull all of those things together and to work on that, the concept in HISA of the covered horse, defining what the covered horse is, and then the covered persons that surround that individual horse have all been a part of this uptake that's sort of gone on with evolving this platform to where we get to now to execute on the strategy. And so I think one of the bigger things that's created a lot of anxiety is, you know, the anticipation, you know, of the change and how 
people will react to those changes and what will be done. I tell a lot of people, especially here in Keeneland or, you know, my colleagues that I have here in Kentucky that, you know, we're already doing about 85 or 90 percent of what's already in HISA. I think we find that if you really kind of look through a lot of the approaches that are there, their best practices that have been getting integrated across the uh, landscape of the industry, as well as across our veterinary colleagues and racetrack practice since 2019. And I think, you know, it's um, one of the things that I do share with a lot of people and, you know, I hear a lot of people about is, you know, one of the things that you find within the safety agreement we have at Keeneland, which is also part of the safety program, but it's also in um, the HISA documents is, you know, this revolving around attending veterinarians, examining horses before speed works and before entries to races. There's a particular time point that those should take place, but this is a real advocacy moment. This is a point, point in time where the trainer and the veterinarian are aligned, looking at that individual horse to do, together to do a soundness evaluation on the horse uh, to ensure that that horse is being presented uh, in its ba- best and safest possibility and that is a been is a, to me the huge cultural shift that sort of a, that has been adopted here and is also we're seeing played out to the benefit of the horse it's it opens up these novel conversations every time a horse goes to compete on behalf of that individual that we're having this conversation about regardless at what level of competition is existing and if you think about the magnitude of that and what that does to safeguard the horse i mean it's just it's just almost it's innumerable the number of possibilities that you can focus on that are um, really become this this component of this advocacy moment on behalf of that horse and so that's typically you know a place that i try to push back a little bit because even the medication policies and all those things, if you think about it now and where they're positioned, when you make that examination and you look at that horse with the trainer now and evaluate the suitability for that horse to compete, you're looking at that horse, you know, free and clear of all these things and what, you know, exactly should be presented on race day. And so you have this moment to really make good judgments and to share those experiences with the regulatory veterinarians who are entrusted on race day for the protection of the horse. So in essence, the way I look at it is that you're protecting the welfare of the horse, you're ensuring the integrity of racing, and you're protecting the public trust in racing and the stewardship of the horse. And why wouldn't we all want that? And I think the stewardship point point is another one that's a really good one that you make because, you know, we certainly know we have a declining foal crop. You know, it's important for us to safeguard and care for and protect, you know, horses in that respect, but also to safeguard and protect an industry. You mm-hmm. know, we, we, we want others and, and, and those who come from behind us to be able to enjoy these same opportunities that our generations have enjoyed. And so, you know, I think that these advocacy moments, this point in time, you know, I hope that we will look back on and say, gosh, you know, there, there, there was the, the thing that we got right. This is the thing we did for the horse that paid back this huge return on that investment that an entire industry has put into um, being there for and on behalf of the horse. Yep. And they put the food on my plate and the roof over my yeah. head. So yeah. we owe them. That's right. Every bit of it. Yeah. Stuart, this has been a pleasure. Thank you for coming in and illuminating HISA. It's something that I think a lot of people have had trouble getting their head around. But really all this is aimed at is trying to do the right thing by the horse and make sure that racing is held in good regard for all the futures that we will have. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and it's uh, always good to get to come in and share and collaborate with uh, my colleagues, so I appreciate the time you've yeah, given. Yeah, you've been, you've been a good friend, Stuart. Yeah, I really, absolutely. Really enjoyed. I feel the same way. Yeah. So right. that was uh, stall side this week. We were talking to Dr. Stuart Brown from Keeneland about HISA. See you next time. Mm-hmm.